The objective of psychotherapy is to support and promote the growth of an individual's consciousness to its fullest extent. But what exactly does consciousness entail? What do we truly mean when we refer to consciousness? In his book Psychological Types, Carl Jung says, By consciousness I understand the relation of psychic contents to the ego insofar as this relation is perceived as such by the ego. Relations to the ego that are not perceived as such are unconscious. Consciousness is the function or activity which maintains the relation of psychic contents to the ego. Consciousness is not identical with the psyche because the psyche represents the totality of all psychic contents, and these are not necessarily all directly connected with the ego, that is, related to it in such a way that they take on the quality of consciousness. To delve deeper into this concept, let's explore its etymology. The word conscious finds its roots in two Latin elements, con meaning with or together, and sire, which translates to to know or to see. Interestingly, conscience shares the same origin as conscious, pointing to a common meaning of knowing with or seeing with another. On the other hand, we have the term science, also derived from sire, but it signifies a different kind of knowing, a simple knowing without the aspect of withness. This etymological insight suggests a connection between the phenomena of consciousness and conscience, hinting that consciousness involves two key components, knowing and withness. In simpler terms, consciousness is the experience of knowing alongside another, existing within a context of two-ness. One facet of consciousness pertains to the act of knowing itself. To engage in the psychological function of knowing or perceiving, the undifferentiated and diffuse experience must be divided into a subject and an object, the knower and the known. This original division, reminiscent of the separation of world parents described by Eric Neumann, signifies the birth of consciousness as the ability to know. The subject becomes distinct from the object, enabling the act of knowing to take place. This process of separating subject from object recurs with each increase in consciousness. When the ego encounters an unconscious content, it can only become aware of it by creating a separation that allows it to observe the emerging psychic content and disidentify from it. Transforming an unconscious complex into an object of knowledge is a crucial aspect of expanding consciousness. Symbolically, the mirror represents this process of separating the knower from the known. It embodies the psyche's capacity to perceive objectively and liberate itself from the grip of primal chaos. In chapter 95 of the Acts of John, Jesus told his disciples, A mirror am I to thee that perceivest me. And in chapter 96 he says, Behold thyself in me, perceive what I do, for thine is this passion of the manhood which I am about to suffer. In this text, Jesus is instructing the disciples how to separate subject from object, how to perceive experience as a mirror that provides an image of meaning rather than as chaotic anguish. This notion aligns with the concept of active imagination or meditative reflection, wherein one can transform oppressive moods into objects of knowledge by uncovering the meaningful essence within those moods. Jung, describing his own decisive encounter with the unconscious, says, To the extent that I managed to translate the emotions into images, that is to say, to find the images which were concealed in the emotions, I was inwardly calmed and reassured. The timeless mythical tale of Perseus and Medusa serves as a poignant example of the significance of separating subject from object through the power of reflection. In this myth, gazing directly at Medusa turns one into stone, representing a psychic content that threatens the ego's existence. The only way to overcome this peril is through the use of a mirror shield provided by Athena, where Medusa can be observed indirectly. Athena's mirror shield embodies the essence of human culture itself, offering redemption from the destructive horror of raw being represented by Medusa. Through language, art, drama and learning, humanity gains a figurative mirror to perceive and understand the depths of the psyche. Dreams and fantasies can also fulfill a similar mirror function. For instance, a man undergoing early stages of analysis had a dream in which he looked into a mirror and was startled to see his father's face instead of his own. This dream revealed that he had become overly identified with his father, unknowingly living out his father's unhappy fate. By reflecting upon this dream, the man gained a mirror-like insight into his situation, making his identification with his father an object of knowledge. 
This realization enabled him to separate his ego, subject of knowledge, from his identification with his father, object of knowledge, taking his first step toward increased consciousness. Now, the experience of being the knowing subject, however, is only one half of the process of knowledge. The other half is the experience of being the known object. In the journey of self-awareness, the ego assumes the role of a knower, attempting to conquer the external world and the inner realms by turning them into objects of knowledge. However, this limited form of knowing, while resembling consciousness, falls short of true understanding. To attain genuine consciousness, the ego must also undergo the profound experience of becoming the known object itself. It needs to relinquish its position as the all-knowing subject and entrust the function of knowing to an other entity. This shift in perspective is essential for reaching authentic self-awareness. During the process of psychotherapy, this transformation often occurs. The therapist, unknowingly, carries the projection of the knowing other, causing the patient to feel reduced to a mere object of knowledge. This state, induced by transference, may be partial and temporary, but it carries some risks. The patient might develop a personal dependence on the therapist, relying on them as the sole source of knowledge. This dependence on the therapist can lead to a substitute for the true reliance on the inner, knowing one, which is the self. It's important to recognize and understand this dynamic, encouraging the patient to ultimately rely on their own inner wisdom and self-awareness, transcending the need for external validation. This process leads to a more profound and lasting form of consciousness, where the self becomes the true source of knowledge and understanding. In a letter written in 1915, Jung describes vividly the dangers to the patient of being known or understood by the analyst. Understanding is a fearfully binding power, at times a veritable murder of the soul as soon as it flattens out vitally important differences. The core of the individual is a mystery of life, which is snuffed out when it is grasped. The menacing and dangerous thing about analysis is that the individual is apparently understood. The devil eats his soul away, which naked and exposed, robbed of its protecting shell, was born Yuki, a child into the light. That is the dragon, the murderer, that always threatens the newborn divine child. He must be hidden once more from the understanding of humanity. As Jung indicates in other sections of the same letter, the therapist's understanding of the patient is necessary for neurotic aspects of the personality. However, it should not be applied to the healthy psyche. Thus, the full experience of being the known object of an other knowing subject is best not projected onto a person, but rather experienced as an encounter with the inner God image, the self. The archetypal image that carries the clearest symbolic expression of the ego's experience of being the known object is the image of the Eye of God. This image played a large role in Egyptian mythology. According to Rundle Clark, the Eye of the High God is the great goddess of the universe in her terrible aspect. Originally, it had been sent out into the primeval waters by God on an errand to bring back Shu and Tefnut to their father. Thus the Eye is the daughter of the High God. When it returned, it found that it had been supplanted in the Great One's face by another, a surrogate eye, which we can interpret as the sun or moon. This was the primary cause for the wrath of the eye, and the great turning point in the development of the universe, for the eye can never be fully or permanently appeased. The High God turned it into a rearing cobra, which he bound around his forehead to ward off his enemies. In the dreams of a middle-aged woman, there is an interesting parallel to the mythological equation of I equals snake. This patient was suffering from a chronic, painful physical illness and also was suffering psychologically in the effort to understand the meaning of her ordeal. She had this dream. I'm talking with friends. Something we talked about caused snakes to start crawling about the room. It was as though they had been inanimate objects on the wall that had been brought to life by something I said. I wanted to kill them, but a friend said I shouldn't. The next dream, a few days later, was this. I went to the kitchen sink to clean it up. It was actually just wet. As I looked at it, the drops of water separated. Each drop had a center in it like fish eggs or eyes. I did not throw them away. This woman used to adopt a passive victim mentality. However, as time went on, she started feeling a sense of rebellion against this victim role. Her dream served as a reflection of this internal struggle. Interestingly, these dreams seemed to come to life when she started paying attention to her unconscious mind or discussing it with others. Initially, 
the dreams featured snakes, which can be seen as a symbol of the emerging instinctual reactions of protest. Over time, these snakes transformed into either fish's eggs or eyes. This transformation can be likened to the Egyptian myth in which the eye of God is turned into a rearing serpent. The underlying idea seems to suggest that the instinctual reactions of protest, symbolized by the snakes, are not just passive elements, but rather autonomous centers of consciousness, represented by the fish's eyes. In essence, they become subjects to the ego's object. In other words, the dreamer began to perceive herself as the object of another subject, referred to as the self. This inner subject, the self, is unwilling to accept the role of meek passivity that comes with being a victim. This image of an eye is discussed by Jung in his essay on the nature of the psyche, where the multiple eye motif is equated with, with multiple luminosities. To be watched by strange fishy eyes gives one the uncanny sense of other presences. The fish's eyes correspond to the multiple eye of God as described in Zechariah. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. The major effect of such an experience is the realization that one is not alone in the psyche. In another Egyptian text, the eye of God says of itself, I am the all-seeing eye of Horus, whose appearance strikes terror, lady of slaughter, mighty one of frightfulness. Being recognized as a known entity, observed by the all-seeing eye of God, can evoke a profound sense of fear and discomfort. This stems from the fact that unconscious aspects of ourselves typically resist being exposed to the light of awareness. They vehemently react to being known because this process dismantles their sense of self-reliance and power, which they enjoy while operating beneath our conscious awareness. These unconscious elements, often referred to as complexes, represent various facets of our ego self-identity. When they are subjected to being known and observed by a higher, transcendental subject like the Eye of God, they face a significant threat. This is because they are relegated to the position of an object, stripped of their autonomy and dominance over our psyche. Now we have explored the two sides of the knowing factor of consciousness. The first is experiencing ourselves as the knowing subject, while the second is experiencing ourselves as the known object. It seems that our psychic journey begins with an unconscious state of being the known object, and only as our ego develops do we gradually reach the more serene state of being the knowing subject. However, as our development continues, we must let go of the relative freedom we've gained as we become aware that our ego is an object of a larger, transpersonal subject known as the self. Once we've experienced both of these aspects, we can then embrace the reconciling third aspect, which highlights the true essence of knowing with. The process of knowing holds great power. To be a knower means to exert control over the known object through the power of Logos, while being the known one means to be subjected to the knower's influence. Participating in the process of knowing involves playing either or both of these roles interchangeably. Nevertheless, the definition of consciousness as knowing with introduces a second dimension, the concept of withness. Withness refers to the dynamic connectedness and the principle of relationships. If knowing represents the function of Logos, withness embodies the function of Eros. Thus, we stumble upon the intriguing realization that the word we use to represent the highest value, consciousness, essentially conveys the idea of a union between Logos and Eros. Understanding knowing with entails the ability to engage in a knowing process simultaneously as both the subject and the object the knower and the known. This is only possible when we relate to an object that can also function as a subject. This object of relationship could be an external other like a person or an internal other like the self. In reality, we need both types of relationships, but the importance we place on outer and inner factors depends on our individual attitude type. Extroverts tend to emphasize their relationship with the external expression of the self, while introverts prioritize their connection with the inner manifestation of the self. To truly become conscious, we must experience both being the one who sees and being the one who is seen, knowing and being known. This is relatively easy to grasp from the perspective of the ego. However, for authentic witness in our knowing process, the same principle applies to the other center of the process, the self. In other words, the self must also become an object in order for true consciousness to emerge. In answer to Job, Jung tells us specifically that existence is only real when it is conscious to somebody. 
That is why the Creator needs conscious man, even though from sheer unconsciousness, he would like to prevent him from becoming conscious. Because Job has seen Yahweh's immoral nature, Yahweh is obliged to change. In psychological terms, because the self has been seen by the ego, the self's consciousness has been promoted. In this way, God, or the self, needs man. The pursuit of consciousness, then, does not allow one to rest in the attitude of being known and contained in God. The ego has a responsibility to the self to be its knowing subject as well as its known object. This idea of mutual knowing between the ego and the self is expressed theologically by Meister Eckhart. It must be understood that this is all the same thing, knowing God and being known by God and seeing God and being seen by God. In Ion, Jung collects examples, especially from Gnosticism, of the image of the ignorant or unconscious God and of changes that occur in the God image in the course of cultural development. He then summarizes his conclusions. These utterances on the nature of the deity express transformations of the God image, which run parallel with changes in human consciousness, though one would be at a loss to say which is the cause of the other. The God image is not something invented, it is an experience that comes upon man spontaneously. The unconscious God image can therefore alter the state of consciousness, just as the latter can modify the God image once it has become conscious. This, obviously, has nothing to do with the prime truth, the unknown God, at least nothing that could be verified. Psychologically, however, the idea of God's ignorance or of the unconscious God is of the utmost importance because it identifies the deity with the numinosity of the unconscious. The reciprocal relations between the ego and the self, in which the self's knowing the ego promotes ego consciousness and the ego's knowing the self promotes self-consciousness, have interesting implications. Ordinarily, we think that suprapersonal powers and images are projections of our own mind. But if reciprocity exists, we equally may be projections of the transpersonal other. One of Jung's dream brings up this idea. I had a dream once. In the dream, I was on a hiking trip. I was walking along a little road through a hilly landscape. The sun was shining and I had a wide view in all directions. Then I came to a small wayside chapel. The door was ajar and I went in. To my surprise, there was no image of the Virgin on the altar, and no crucifix either, but only a wonderful flower arrangement. But then I saw that on the floor in front of the altar, facing me, sat a yogi, in lotus posture, in deep meditation. When I looked at him more closely, I realized that he had my face. I started in profound fright and awoke with the thought, Aha! So he is the one who is meditating me. He has a dream, and I am it. I knew that when he awakened, I would no longer be.